Right now, one of the things uh, that is difficult to uh, forecast is if you want to write a code that will last uh, tens of years, uh, you will have to actually design your code in a way that, that will uh, survive different generations of GPUs, maybe CPUs, and all different architecture. So somewhere addressing this challenge is, of course, addressing massive parallel algorithm, new development methodology and code architecture, and new programming environments. So what I'm going to present you in that talk is first, I will explain you how we see mini core, and especially GPUs. Then I will come to hybrid programming uh, of heterogeneous platform, and what are the rules, uh, what are the kind of techniques that can be this. And I will uh, finally uh, have a very short presentation of my company, uh, Caps Enterprise. So mini core is a technology description. Uh, it's, it's, it's huge in terms of what it brings to the market, in terms of powering new application, but it's also uh, a lot of changes to uh, uh, softwares. And this is what we consider as mini core. So what you have is CPU core, and the number of CPU core is just increasing. And you have over the PCI Express bus, uh, the GPU, that is another form of mini core. This is actually the most parallel mini core that exists. And this PCI Express bus is a limitation in the system, and the GPU has its own memory. So this is actually very, uh, uh, this is from where it, it takes its power. Uh, the important thing in here is the level of parallelism you need to keep such a device busy is in thousands of threads. So if we look at the different level of parallelism, uh, at the highest level, larger brain, you have message passing kind of parallelism. And this is, for instance, what people do when they do the uh, domain decomposition. They slice the domain they are studying into parts, and each part is computed by, the, uh, by a node in a cluster. And between the nodes, there is message passing to exchange data and update every uh, body's node. Um, this is typically what programmer level have to care of, and this is not a tool issue. This is really algorithm programmer problems. At the finest grain, you find ins uh, SIMD instructions uh, with, uh <coughs> for instance, vector instructions like SSC, AVX, and other ones. And this is mostly compiler problem. This is a part that the compiler can take care of for you. And in the middle, there is task parallelism, data string parallelism. Uh, that uh, is the one that will take advantage of many core. And one of the issues with this parallelism, sometimes it can be into application, sometimes it's not there in application because there is no reason why it would have been put there in the first place. Uh, previous GPUs, uh, previous CPUs, sorry, uh, previous CPUs didn't require to highlight this kind of parallelism at a massive scale into applications. HMPP that is mentioned there is the CAPS uh, product uh, and uh, it's uh, oriented to data parallelism. I will talk about more about data parallelism later, but this is a favorite form of parallelism to deal with many core. And this is the one that GPU exploits right now. One of the questions we had on, on many core is, okay, we, we talk about many core, many core are coming, everybody mostly agrees about that, but when? Okay, when can we put a date on on many core being a generalized problem. And so what we did is to draw those pictures. So uh, the light blue is the gigahertz of the Intel processors. And after 2012, that's a forecast. But basically, we are forecasting that this will not increase. Um, it, it's for the, all the reasons I said before, energy and, and uh, the technological limitations. The GPU one is the orange one. and uh, at the beginning, it was 128. I know it's about 512. And that's a number, of course. And it will keep increasing, because you cannot increase the frequency of the processor. Okay? So the amount of parallelism you will have is still growing and will be more and more important. The dark blue is the interprocessor number of what we call processing unit. Uh, we don't, I, I didn't put cores, because um, cores is not very accurate. Uh, from the software point of view, the level of parallelism you see is the number of cores multiplied by the hyper-threading level. So if you take now for Intel processor, it's about 20, so 10 cores multiplied by 2 hyper-threading on some degree. 
And in the future, it will keep increasing. If you can't increase the, the frequency of the processors, uh, the uh, number of cores or hyper-threading have to increase. And so, if you look at that picture, that basically in 2014, you can see that the level of Parison for CPUs uh, will be, you will need to keep a CPU busy, is the same level of Parison you needed uh, in the past for GPUs. So actually, uh, there is two interesting things in, in this uh, comment. The first one is, you won't escape massive Parison on a chip. Okay? That, that's obvious, but this is coming very fast, and uh, the problem is coming very fast, it's making a very odd problem for software. On the other hand, you don't know exactly what will be the device by three years, four years, and five years. The other thing is, GPU is a better way to access any core, because the work you've done for GPUs is going to be very useful for any kind of many core device in the future. The Parison you highlight for GPUs is actually also going to be very useful for CPUs. And you will have somewhere to have massive Parison because in most systems you will want to keep the CPU as well as the GPU busy, not only one of the devices at a time. So that picture is saying that somewhere software really have to migrate. And if we want to migrate software for many core, we have to set up some rules, some, some indications, and uh, uh, some guidelines. Um, just another comment on, on the other. Everybody is everybody, going to the same direction somewhere. Uh, if you look at Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, and so on. It's going to massive Parison, and you will have a mix. What you can expect is a mix between fat cores, out of order cores, power and grid, and smaller cores, much more energy efficient, but in large number. Yeah. And this is somewhere in the model uh, we can forecast. But still there is a um, homogeneous uh, processor like IBM, Fujitsu, and ARM uh, processor that are still increasing the number of core but keep keeping them homogeneous. So if I try to summarize from the software point of view, this is what we're talking about, where, what we can expect from, from the architecture. Okay? Uh, on which base we can design a new software or migrate legacy code. So the first thing is, you cannot, of course, assume uh, uniform memory accesses. But in s the case of heterogeneous many core, it's even worse. It's really, there will be really fast access on some uh, memories and very, very slow accesses on the other memory. And actually, this is because you have multiple memories. So if, if you are accessing the data through the, uh, of your GPU, it's fast. If you are accessing through UVA, for instance, the data of the CPU inside the GPU, it's going to be very slow. There is, um, uh, you will have small and fat cores if you take the full system, CPU, GPU, and even uh, maybe in the CPU itself. And it's, you probably will have multiple devices. Multiple devices means multiple memories. And over time, the balance between the small and the fat core is going to change. So somewhere, you have to plan for that. Uh, you have to plan that your software will have to retune with a different balance. Um, the last thing is, you have to expose multiple parties in form if you want to take full advantage of the, uh, of the device. Uh, one of the things I talked about already is the number of cores, number of threads supported by hardware. And the other thing is a vector form of parallelism. If you take CPU, for instance, you get AVX, AV, the uh, vector interfere are getting larger and larger. And so, as they are getting larger, you can't ignore that level of parallelism when you have to find a trade-off between threads and vector parallelism. And somewhere, it will impact on the tuning of applications. So, when you look at what, what's said about HPC challenge by IDC, uh, what it says? It says software is the issue. Okay. Uh, porting legacy code uh, in many cases require major redesign. And why you need redesign? Because the algorithm that is implemented in the application doesn't highlight enough parallelism for the devices. So in many cases, application will just won't scale. And the scaling you're looking at, it's thousands of threads. So GPU people are used to that. But this is not yet a generalized practice. And many code are not GPU friendly. And they will have to move to something that is kind of GPU friendly. And ISV code will take a long time to move uh, because uh, they need to be modernized. But usually, they are very difficult to validate and so on. On the other hand, HPC must become 
much simpler because HPC issues are going to be shared with many, many uh, different programmers. Not only the HPC REM people that are in this room, but also the other people that are more um, programmers, uh, basic programmers, they will have those devices because there will be no other device on the market and they will have to do that. So HPC can't be uh, only reserved uh, uh, to, to, to expert programmers. It has to become, the tools used in HPC has to become simpler so they can be accessible uh, to uh, many programmers. And that's actually the move by NVIDIA with OpenSEC uh, we are part of. Another thing is the application development and process. The way you do things is going to be very important because you cannot also expect programmers to be uh, an application programmer, expert in application, for instance, Meteo, and also be an expert in many core. So somewhere, the way engineers in many core and engineers in um, uh, in applications, we have to to, uh, to 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 work together to make things efficient. Uh, and the last thing is exascale computing. And one of the important things with exascale is fault tolerance, energy uh, management, and so on. And all those issues that are addressed by exascale can also be issues for, for supercomputing centers and so. So, hybrid programming for heterogeneous platforms. So one of the rules, okay, the, the, the application programmer issue is you want to reduce maintenance cost. That's a very important thing. You, you want the, the code to be easy to maintain and you want to preserve code assets. That is, preserving code assets is also preserving the code over different generation. Um, this, is, uh, this is the issue. You don't know what will be the hardware, your favorite hardware by three years. Most of the people here think it's NVIDIA. Okay? It's probably the next generation of NVIDIA, but it might have different properties as the, right, the one right now. So if you want to preserve your asset, you have to find a way that you don't have to rewrite everything every, uh, every time a new generation of hardware is coming. And you want to keep the application code friendly to application programmer. This is actually a very complicated issue because somewhere you can achieve performance by moving uh, right, many codes written in Fortran you add some CUDA part in it, it gets very efficient, but from the software life point of view, the software is dead because the application programmer cannot use it anymore. He can't actually modify the CUDA code because this is not his job. So this is why directive based things are actually interesting. Uh, because they keep the language the application programmer is used to. So if he's used to program in Fortran, he keeps his Fortran code. If he's used to program in C and C++, it keeps this C and C++ code with the C and C++ semantics. So, somewhere, what we are talking about when writing code for many core is how to deal with uncertainties. You don't know what the future is, but you know what is your ser serial code. So, let's take the serial code now, add directives that will add information, code generation techniques that goes with the directives, and in this way, you have something safe. And that's one of the ideas behind the, uh, uh, <coughs> behind the, the, the use of directives. On the other hand, it doesn't solve the algorithm problem. Okay? If there is no parallelism in your application, there is no way it's going to be useful. And in many cases, uh, some assumptions will have to be reviewed because the code were so designed for a CPU with a small number of out of order cores, big cores, that uh, they won't fit uh, the mini core view. So if I look at the, 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 the rules, the, the basic uh, things for, for software, the driving forces, uh, the first thing is the MDAL zone. Of course, it's, it's, uh, it's obvious, but if part of it, not the main, I mean, the main execution part of your code is not parallel, then you can't take advantage of many core. So in many cases, this is the first bottleneck you find the applications. Uh, the hotspots, that are parallel are too small, they, are, they are represent a very tiny part of the application. In this case, you're just going to be very difficult and the algorithm has to be reviewed. The other property to take advantage when you have a lot of cores, you cannot move data because moving data is expensive in energy first and also in latency. And there is no way you can reduce the latency. So data locality when you have hundreds, thousands of cores is the main issue you have to address. And so that question needs to be addressed from the design point of view of the software, not when you have the software. You have to be able to control that from the beginning. And I already said that a lot of times, massive parallelism. 
So, one, one of the things uh, about that would be, okay, yes, but we have massive parallel algorithms, like the one that run on clusters with MPI. Okay, so why not take those code and make them uh, on, on many cores? So put basically one MPI process per car, uh, which should do it. And that doesn't work, because the use of MPI processes over the core doesn't make, uh, of, the, sorry, of the memory is not efficient. It's not efficient in different ways. You get extra copies, so you're not well using the shared memory. And as I said, data quality and memory is the issue for many core. Uh, so this is already eating the part you don't want to eat in the, in the machine. You are using too much memory, usually, especially when you do domain decompositions. If your domain shrinks, get very small, then you have the buffer zone, and the buffer zone is actually going to be a lot of redundant memory in your system. So you can't replicate, you can't decrease the size of your, uh, of your domain too much uh, to uh, keep the scaling. You get some cache crashing between the MPI processes, and the other thing is that MPI is not good at all is managing heterogeneity. You can't have some MPI on, f on fast core and some MPI on smaller cores and having different speed and get everything that scale. It's extremely difficult. So that approach is very unlikely to work on many core. It's still working with 10 core, okay? With 10 cores, this is still working, but as the number of core increases, the efficiency of having more MPI processes on the nodes is going to be an issue. So let's go to thread-based parallelism as we used to, like OpenMP or uh, any thread APIs. A lot of advantage, we already have codes that are based on that. There, this is a much better way of, of going to mini core. However, you still have problems with data locality and affinity. And as these problems get more and more uh, important, more crucial, uh, you, the, the fact that in current uh, thread package you cannot manage locality is going to be uh, an issue. That is, those, the, the, the thread package most of them were designed to ensure load balancing. And usually you have to choose between load balancing and data locality. Of course it's a trade-off, I mean you, you want something in between. But if you go too much to load balancing, you don't get good locality because moving the work around is also moving data around. So it's much better to actually keep the data at the same place and move the data around. Uh, however, it's not good for all the algorithms, of course. Uh, the other thing that is a problematic with, with thread as they are implemented right now it's uh, on CPUs, is the fact that it's very difficult to trade off between the thread and the vector parity. And uh, somewhere, this is something you will want to tune very carefully to get the performance. Because uh, if you have, for instance, if you use four cores, but, but using four threads, you can't get the parallel uh, and the vector, you cannot get the vector well used, you actually have an inefficient program. And in many cases, you will have to tune the granularity of your thread, what's, what the amount of work is done in the thread, what the early accesses and the data accesses are done in the thread to get the full uh, performance of your architecture. Uh, for instance, when you start to play with uh, hyper-threading, uh, how many cores do you, how many thread per socket do you manage the thread per socket or do you have a global management to be achieve some load balancing and so on. There is many, many questions and actually the current <coughs> thread package are not designed to tune the threads. They are designed to express the threads. Just a word about heterogeneity, just to give you, I mean, I know a lot of, of you know CUDA and so on. I just want to give a very uh, short overview of uh, from the software point of view, there's a partisan point of view about uh, I will go very fast uh, through that. And there is currently uh, different uh, directive-based approaches. Uh, there is OpenACC, that's proposed by uh, NVIDIA, PGI, Cray, and us. OpenMP accelerator extension, that is basically the same people plus some other people. And OpenMP accelerators will probably integrate OpenACC. And there is HMPP, the product we do, that will support, uh, beginning of next year, the syntax of OpenACC. Uh, one of the important things is probably by five years, there will be only one thing, okay? Because everybody, programmers, users, uh, vendors, want only one um, directive base set. And everything will merge 
probably OpenMP or some other standard, but is it will merge to achieve something that is uh, much nicer for the market? But in between, this is a new field, many core is still moving a lot, so you need a lot of practice before you can design a standard that works. So OpenSCC somewhere is the, the common subset that everybody agrees it works uh, at a scale that is uh, sufficient to make it a standard. So data parison, string parison that we are looking for, in a very simple form, it's something like that. So you, you, you want a lot of data, and you want to apply the same function to the data. Okay? And this gives you massive parison, because when you have a lot of data, you have massive parison. That also means when you have a small amount of data, you don't scale. Mm -hmm. And this is, so uh, this is really well suited for GPUs, but also many core. And how do you achieve efficiency on the GPU? Uh, you manage the thread by groups called warps on, on, on GPUs. And this has one disadvantage, is when the control flow is divergent, you lose efficiency because all threads are executed the same thing in lockstep fashion. But there is a big advantage in doing so. I come to it. And so, from the GPU point of view, why do you need massive parison? Because you, need, you have a lot of cores to keep busy on one end, and on the other end, you want the bandwidth from the memory. And the memory is very efficient, a lot of bandwidth, but very far from the GPU, so from the, 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 the cores. And so what you need is actually the parison that keep the core busy, but also the parison between threads that keep the pipeline of the memory accesses busy. Okay? So you always need much more threads than you have as a member of cores. But the advantage of this way of running for GPUs and especially CUDA uh, uh, NVIDIA devices is because they work in lockstep, when somebody is doing, when a thread is doing a load, every other uh, threads are doing uh, the same load, not at the same address. And so the hardware that is clever actually optimize the accesses by parallelizing the memory accesses. And this way you get very efficient memory accesses and very fast memories. But that requires that when you programming, you take that into account, because when that doesn't work, the performance is really bad, and most of the performance of the GPU is coming from these great memory systems that can load a lot of data to the cores. So this is a property you need to take into account when you're dealing with the GPUs and efficiency and performance. Uh, CUDA is very simple, okay, and this is a very nice property. Uh, this is uh, just a kernel, you have seen all that. And it's very explicit and very easy to teach. Actually, uh, we like to use CUDA to teach parallel programming because this is the best way to actually introduce all the notions and the performance issues. And you see in that code, you can explain the PCI Express bus through the uh, CUDA memory transfer. So explain if you have a lot of those and so on. And this is something you don't see with the directives. So when we teach directives, uh, we want to first teach CUDA because people start to understand the machine models that is underlying uh, that CUDA is underlying, and then uh, you get the uh, <coughs> um, you you explain directives, but people understand the, 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 the model behind it. The other one that OpenCL OpenCL is uh, is is same thing same parallel model as CUDA, right? So so that's actually great, but the, the uh, the runtime is is uh, is actually lower level, and it's portable syntax, not portable performance. And one of the reasons for that is if you take an AMD device and an NVIDIA device, the memory structure is different. So on one end, you want coalescing to happen on NVIDIA. On AMD, you want uh, you want <coughs> uh, <coughs> you want vectorization to happen to get the bandwidth from the memory. And there's actually two different ways of programming in OpenCL. And if you go on GPU, it's again a different tuning. So, same parallel same par model. Uh, Runtime API are different, and CUDA, uh, but CUDA is a more advanced. CUDA not being a standard can actually be uh, uh, in the forefront of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the features and actually bring new things that then can eventually go to the uh, uh, to the standard. So it's important to have this actually kind of 
programming models that may not be standardized, but that can move very fast in technology and propose new solutions, and then standard can say, okay, this is a good solution, you keep it. And you need that for many core because there is so many things to still discover and to actually analyze before it become a, a best practice that uh, we need this. HMPP is a directive-based we do, okay, so it's sold by, by, by us. And the idea is very simple. The idea is to say, okay, I want a function. We call it a codelet because it can't accept all code uh, of an application. It has some restriction, like IOs, for instance. And this codelet, we say, I want it to run on the on the GPU. Okay. So what you do for that? You will generate a CPU version. You will generate that will be your backup. You will generate a CUDA version uh, from the code of the application. The parallel loops inside will be used to generate the CUDA kernels, the parallel CUDA kernels. And when you want to run that functions onto the GPU, then you just say, okay, I want to that call to run the GPU. And then everything else, uh, the data transfer and everything else happens. This is trivial, this is not very difficult to do. What is really difficult to do is to make that efficient. And as I will say, is to make that also collaborate with the libraries. Uh, we'll come back to that. So if you want to see the difference between HMPP parallelism and uh, CUDA parallelism, in one way we are using the, uh, uh, the parallel loops, and the parallel loops become threads. And in the other hand, you are using threads that have IDs, and the, from the IDs you know what you have to compute. Right? That's the way you program. And if you look at the two styles, it's actually very close. It's not too difficult to go one way or the other way. Because the CUDA grid is actually an iteration space. You can see it this way. And so if you want to convert that into loops, it's actually not so, so difficult. Uh, I mean, for simple CUDA. So the, the two models are, are, are close. However, uh, when you are dealing with the, the threads, when you start to tune the code, you want to change it, it's actually less convenient than changing a loop body. And I will show you that actually with an example that the uh, tuning is usually easier to do with uh, starting from loops and starting from CUDA. So we have these directive things and we said this is a way, the directive is a way to preserve the serial code. So, so somewhere it's also a way to make the best of the serial code that exists and it's a way to uh, preserve from the future. Yeah. But if we try to make some rules now, what, what do I have to do to make my code many core friendly? Uh, I have to, we, we try to set a few rules. Okay, so the first one is, again, massive parallelism in a target independent way. And this is the important part. You don't want your coding practice to hide parallelism. On CPU serial code, you don't need to care about that. So you can have code that where everything is mixed. But when you go to, uh, to, parallel, uh, to parallel computing, you, you want to make sure you understand how data are used. And the data part is really important because this is the one that tells if it's parallel. And this is also the one that will forbid you to copy the data over a different address space and so on. You want to keep the code debugger friendly. Uh, that part is uh, very important because when you start to add logical bugs with parallel bugs, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare. So you want to separate both issues. You want to track performance issues. This is a primary reason for many core. So if, if performance is not your concern, you should not be concerned by many core. And you want to exploit libraries. Uh, libraries, as we know them now, are the, the, the importance of libraries is going to increase a lot. Why? Because many programmers are not experts in parallel programming, and libraries are a way to bring expert code to application people. So the need for libraries, domain-specific techniques, is going to increase a lot just because you cannot make any application programmer become a specialist of parallel programming on many core. So and the last rule is when you're not, usually you save a lot of things when you don't want the last drop of performance. So if you can stick into the 80% of the uh, performance of the, the code, of the potential performance of the code of the machine, you keep a code much simpler. So, data structure management. Uh, I want to stress data locality. One of the things is, 
you want to be able to move data easily from one other space to another one. Uh, that is, your data structure must be easily serialized stable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can't move them on the GPU or in another device, and you don't even know in the future how much of the memory will be kept coherent, because when you get thousands of cores, that operation is not trivial, and if it's there, it's expensive anyway. You don't want to waste memory. The number of the memory per core is not increasing. So if you start to waste memory, you will get more trashing and more issue with uh, uh, performance. You want simple data structure because you have to use the vector instructions. When there are vector instructions, you want to make sure the compiler can actually understand what's happening with the data structure so it can analyze data dependencies and vectorize the code. Uh, if you don't get the vector part of your code, you can lose a lot of performance. You also want to make sure that your data structure are designed with the libraries in mind. And uh, libraries usually have their own ways of understanding the data structure and you want to, to cover. And lastly, if you look at, for instance, sparse matrix uh, computation, if you look at the one for CPUs and the one for GPUs, usually they are not different. They are not the same, sorry. And so somewhere, you, you have to think that, oh, at some point I may have to replace that data structure by another one that is friendly with mine. So all the design of your code must make uh, use rules or architecture that uh, make it easy to change from one data structure to another one. I know it's easy to say, it's difficult to, 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 to do. Okay. Um, in, in HMPP, we promote data collections. I'm just going to give you a, an example of what this is. A uh, data collection is a way to deal with multiple devices. Uh, a data collection is just a set of data you can index in parallel. So it's not a constraint. Thing. But the element of data are a serializable part of data. That means uh, in C, for instance, it's, it's, it's contiguous, or in Fortran, it's contiguous. And what you can do in HMPP is create mirror of those data on the different, different devices. So this way, you allocate on, for instance, three GPUs, the different piece of data. Yeah? And then you allocate the work. And one of the important things in here is to make sure that when you express where the work goes, it's independent from the allocation of data. I'm going to show you that just after. You want to expose massive parallelism. I'm really interested in parallelism. Uh, you don't want to hide it uh, by awkward coding. Uh, we, we see when we are dealing with code, when you have 20 levels of calling in a sequence, you don't know what you're computing. You, 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 you have so many uh, calls by calls and calls and so on. So it is extremely difficult to parallelize the code and to understand data dependencies in those codes. And somewhere you want to separate constraints between functionality, application level, and performance coding. So if you can do that, this is great, because then that means the application programmer will stay in his expertise domain, and the computer science domain can come in and actually tune the code. Data parallelism is a simple form, easier to debug, and this is actually one of the favorite, <laughs> our favorite form of parallelism. Uh, but in some cases, it's not good. Okay? It's for some application, you can't use it. But when you can use that, it's actually very convenient. It's convenient for many devices. It will work for CPU and it will work for GPUs. Um, and the, the, with data parallelism, you make a choice. You are not going to load balancing. You are going to data locality. So depending on your, the pain of one or the other. At the kernel levels, uh, they have to be massively parallel. You cannot afford kernels that are not uh, granularities too small. And the things you have to think about is about data affinity. Do you understand the data affinity between your kernels? That is, if your kernel is using the data, is the other kernel using the same data? And do you know where the other data will move around the machine? If you don't know that, that means you are not controlling. You cannot tune the code. You don't understand the performance of your code. And the other thing is you need massive parallelism because you need to tune the ratio between vector and thread parallelism. This is a parallelism in HMPP, again. Uh, we have two levels. We consider the one in codelet, so the parallel loops inside the functions will be used to keep a device busy. Okay. And between the device, you can have multiple calls on the different elements of the collections. The collection here is, here is D0, D1, D2, D3, and you have a mirror, D1, D2, D3, uh, into the device memory. And what that loops does 
it says you run in parallel over the different devices uh, these codelets that will exploit the parallelism inside the device. What is nice with this way of writing is it's serial code, it has a serial semantics, so it's a normal C code or normal Fortran code, and on the other hand, it doesn't say where the computation is. Okay? So it's independent on where the data have been allocated. So if you want to change the number of devices, it's very easy. You don't have to change the computational part, you just have to change the allocation of the data over the devices. So usually this is located in some part of the code, but everything else is independent of the code. And the way the compiler does is to look at where the mirror, so if you take DK here, it will look at where is the mirror allocated, and from that information, it will know where it has to compute. Of course, if you have multiple data mirrors, they need to be on the same, you cannot call uh, a codelet that is using data from different devices, so you have to have them aligned, that's a restriction. Expressing the parallelism, uh, what you want is to express parallelism, not express implementation of the parallelism. Uh, this is uh, what we do with HMPP. We try to get just a small level above the parallelism that is useful. You don't want to be very high level because then the code generation can be very messy or very difficult to make efficient. You want just a bit, a bit above so you can generate different forms. So there is two tricks to do that. The first one is to focus on some form of parallelism. Here is data parallelism in parallel loops. By focusing on this range of parallelism, you can actually have a very large set of device you can address. You restrict the form of parallelism, it gives you an advantage in code generation. Uh, this is what, and this is, uh, the right side is the uh, uh, is, is, uh, HMPP directive. The first one, greedy file, it's a way to express how to partition the iteration space on different devices. Uh, and you, you may want a lot of different uh, ways of partitioning depending on the device, and depending on the computation, depending on the number of cores, depending on the vector size, and so on. The other things you have is HMPP, CG, Unroll, and Jam is a way to control the amount of computation, computation and memory accesses uh, into your threads. And this way it's easy to, to tune because usually the part that uh, is is specific to a machine are the values. So depending on the computation, you will have different program transformation. But what will change from one machine to another one is the values. And we have seen that, for instance, between uh, Tesla 1060 to uh, Tesla 2050. Uh, we had to retune the code, and usually it was limited to changing the grid size and changing the overall engine parameters. Because that part are really to do with the machine configuration. But this is too easy to do this way. Okay. Uh, just to highlight the fact that being a bit high level is, is, is a way to preserve the code and just expressing the Python is imagine you have to transform OpenMP into vector ISA because the machine is mostly based on the vector ISA instructions. This is almost, you can't do a compiler to do that. You cannot do a compiler that takes OpenCL code and transform it in OpenMP. But you can take an HMPP program, it will generate uh, OpenMP, could OpenCL and vector ISA. OpenMP generation, thread generation, is planned for next year. In the next release, it's already working in house. So how, may, how much performance do I lose by going through directives? Mm -hmm. uh, not much, not much. Basically, we took the, 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 the Kublas and Magma. This is a useless programming. We, we just wanted to see, can we use directive to generate the best, what we know to be the most efficient uh, optimized code on, on, on Tesla. And uh, Kublas and, and Magma has been highly tuned on Fermi and uh, we, we so with HMPP we got within 10% of the best performance. Why do we have this 10% difference? Uh, it's mostly because we when you generate the code you can't control as much the register locations and you have some temporary variables that mess up a bit with the compiler and in the end you lose a bit of performance. That is another DGMs and uh, DGMs. And actually, the, if you look at uh, SGM, DGM, and ZGMs, they don't have the same profile in terms of use of data and memory balance. This is an example in the other way. That is, you get better performance with HMPP uh, than with uh, CUDA uh, coding. And this was done not by us, this was done by somebody from CEA in France. And he wrote a CUDA version and then an HMPP version and actually got better results with HMPP. 
The reason is not, <laughs> it's not a limitation of CUDA. We generate CUDA code, so there is no reason why you will not achieve that. But the thing is, it's easier to tune the code starting from a higher level than starting from CUDA. And this explains the difference. The programmer got bored to optimize the CUDA code. So at some point, he did stop. And when he went to HMPP, he could actually tune more and get more just because uh, that was requiring less effort on his side. So in, we have seen that frequently that uh, the, the efficiency you get from directives uh, pays off in terms of performance. It's not intrinsically, I mean, then you can look at what the code has been generated and propagate it back to CUDA. Um, efficiency actually makes tuning better. You want to track Ambar's law in your code, um, since Parism is about performance, and this is what you want, and you want to add that to your uh, uh, <coughs> part of your validation process, and you want to check scalability. Most of the time, uh, we look at it, it's, it's actually, it's, for some, some code, it's difficult to implement in a uh, contiguous integration process because the code is difficult to run or make a long, long time run. But trying to get the performance issues be detected as soon as possible, it's a good way uh, to keep the code efficient and scalable. One of the, to help programmer uh, to uh, deal with those issues and performance tricks, uh, we designed the, what we call the HMPP wizard. The HMPP wizard is a tool that is uh, um, just to avoid you to read hundreds of pages of documentation. So it takes your code and tries to look what are the tricks that can be applied to your, your code. So a very simple trick, for instance, is to tell you if there exists a GPU version of this library code. So for the blast one, it's easy for uh, the FFT, so some FFT, it's easy. But for some others, you may not know if there is the FFT equivalent. And uh, this tool will tell you that. It will also give you also uh, other kind of transformation, proposal advices for, for instance, using a wall and jam, or it will detect convolution scheme and then will tell you how convolutions should be optimized, as fancy computation can be optimized and so on. So it's a very basic thing, but it's a way to um, it's a way to promote um, to, to to give you access in an easy manner to all the tuning uh, practice you can, you can have. The debugging issue, uh, the debugging issue is actually a very serious one. I already said that, but I will keep saying it. Um, the fact that you keep a serial code with um, with directives solve part of that problem. That is, you can always run your code on the CPU, check if it's giving you the right answer, and then you move to the parallel execution, and then if you have a bug, it's probably, not always, it's probably a parallel bug, some lack of synchronization, race condition, and so on. And this is, I think, one of the great advantage of, uh, of directive basics. However, if you want to push that, you cannot, you have to keep your serial library into your code. Now this is actually something I'm going to show you because it's non-trivial in practice. Um, and of course, you want to use um, debuggers. Uh, and HMPP, has, uh, we have uh, actually an agreement and uh, uh, Alinea DBT has been made HMPP friendly, so you don't have to go into the low-level generating code of HMPP to debug it. This is my last topic, and this is, I think, a very uh, crucial one. Um, if you want one source code, you cannot replace, for instance, a FFTW code by a QFFT code, because then you have two codes. You, you don't have a code that works on the CPU uh, version of the code. And frequently, all the libraries, they have their ways of seeing data structure or they seeing uh, initialization and so on. Uh, the other reason why in most code you cannot change the libraries, the serial libraries that was used in, in the original code, in the legacy code, is because you don't see all the code. So other part of the code might be using that library. Um, and, <coughs> and so, again, for, for the uh, There is one big issue with libraries, is the data. Where is the data? Where is the updated data? Uh, most of the libraries, like FFT, BLAST, and others, they are all assuming a shared memory. And so they are done considering that there may be copies of data uh, around. And the efficiency of those libraries depends on if the data is already on the GPU, I can use a GPU-based library. Otherwise, I can't because it will be less efficient. 
Um, another thing is libraries can be written in many different languages. You can have uh, libraries written in CUDA and so on. So you want to mix all those things. Um, so let me show you what comes into uh, HMPP. In HMPP, we have this called proxy mechanism. So you can annotate with the directives uh, uh, a library code. And what it will, HMPP will do, it, it will replace that code by the proxy. Okay? So if you ignore the directives, this is original code. And if you compile with HMPP, this is the proxy code. And the proxy will be making the link between the execution context, where you already have allocated GPUs, already allocated data on the GPUs, and the library implementation on the GPU. So the organization, global organization, is like that. So you have your original code, legacy code. It will call a proxy after it has been changed. And that proxy will be able to, through the HMPP runtime API, ask how many GPU have you allocated? You need to know that because otherwise, you know. is the parameters mirror already on the GPU? Uh, so, and then the CPU code and the GPU code can actually collaborate on knowing which one is updated uh, or not. And then the proxy can decide to execute on the GPU or just go back to the original code uh, for the uh, um, for the serial implementation on, on CPU. So, to conclude uh, this talk, uh, the key success is the algorithm. This is the base, okay? The tools and, and techniques and best practice, they are just there to keep the parallelism alive, to keep it efficient. Uh, Directive-based approach, we believe it's one of the most uh, um, promising track because it preserves uh, property for debugging. Uh, it's not making much assumption on the future, you're not assuming the future will be open CL everywhere, uh, for instance. Um, and somewhere you separate Python from the implementations. Uh, if you take open ACC or HMPP, you're not making much assumption on the architecture. You're assuming the compiler will generate the right implementations. And in any cases, uh, the, in the end, software engineering as is part of it, and the code architecture is actually very important. And the fact that you can separate the performance part from the application part uh, will be in the future a major asset. Just a word about Caps Enterprise to, to finish. So we are a company uh, from France at the origin, but now we have uh, an office in America, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, an office in Shanghai, and uh, of course in Europe. Uh, we have uh, most of our customers are HPC customers uh, all over the world, and uh, we have uh, many business partners. And one of the important things we believe uh, for many core, it's not a one company business, it's an ecosystem business. And Caps, we have been working a lot on building an ecosystem. In particular, uh, in Shanghai, we have been this uh, competent center with the uh, uh, Jetong University, Shanghai Jetong Universities, because we think. To enter many core, you need a lot of competence. Tools is a part we wish to bring, but you still need algorithm, people, training, and all those issues to achieve anything you want. Thank you. Thank you.